Welcome to Seek Reality. I'm Roberta Grimes and I'm delighted you're with us today. Today our guest is a wonderfully curious man we've been following at Seek Reality for quite some time now. When we first met him, Mark Gober was a recent Princeton graduate and he was just about as buttoned down as that title would suggest, but he'd only then wandered off the mainstream reservation and he had discovered the primacy of consciousness and he couldn't let it go, so he had to write about it. And he wrote a truly amazing groundbreaking book that was right up our alley here. It was called An End to Upside Down Thinking dispelling the myth that the brain produces consciousness and the implications for everyday life. I loved it. Mark actually at the time seemed a bit dazed to me at the time because uh, he knew what he'd found and he knew I think that at that time his life had been taken over by consciousness. His book was just fabulous. I loved it and it frankly the rest was history for him. He followed that book with five more wonderful books. Each was even better than the one before. The next four were An End to Upside Down Living, Reorienting Our Consciousness to Live Better and Save the Human Species. Then came An End to Upside Down Liberty, Turning Traditional Political Thinking on Its Head to Break Free from Enslavement. Remember these? And end upside down contact. I think we skipped this one because I couldn't, I kind of, it was a bit too far for me. UFOs, aliens and spirits and why their ongoing interaction with human civilization matters. And end to upside down, well, this is when we skipped. And end to the upside down reset, the leftist vision for society under the great reset and how it can fool caring people into supporting harmful causes. I don't do politics here. And now comes an end to upside down medicine and why consciousness is needed for a new paradigm of health. This one, this one really blew my mind. And this one we're going to do today. This is our second attempt at it because I, but we did it the first time. I hadn't finished reading it and I really wanted to. But this, this latest book, I think, is very, very important. I've just finished reading it and we really are going to dig into this one. Every book that Mark Gober re writes is, frankly, an amazing expose of the truth that almost no one else dares to seek and to find. And he, he digs up stuff that everybody else walks by, looks at, and does this. They just ignore. They don't want to even think about. It's, it is truly amazing to me what we live with, except and let affect our lives because we don't want to look at the fact that underneath it all is consciousness and everybody pretends that's just not true everybody allows the experts in our lives to be not expert at all because our consciousness underlies everything mark welcome and thank you for upsetting our entire world Thank you. Thank you so much for being back with us. I just really love you, my dear. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the warm introduction. And it's always such a pleasure to speak with you. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. I just finished reading the rest of your book. I had only written, rather read a little bit of it when we talked, I think around just after the first of the year. And wow, I don't even know where to begin with this. It's just, it's overwhelming, frankly. I, where, Maybe where Roberta, we, we can start with what really piques my curiosity about this topic of medicine. And I realize this, this is what typically happens in my research. I, I hear about a few anomalies, things that don't really make sense. And then when I try to make sense of them, I realize there's a bigger picture. So with regard to the primacy of consciousness, I didn't start there. I learned about psi phenomena, near-death experiences, and so forth. And then I realized these all tie to the primacy of consciousness. S similarly, with regard to medicine, I learned about anomalies, which we'll discuss today, about, about, let's say, viruses, the role of consciousness in healing, vaccines. And I realized the bigger, the bigger question is, what are the determinants of health and disease? What is it that makes us sick? If we have a symptom of something, what is actually going on? Because I realized that in our, in our minds, we have a whole narrative of something that happens, all these processes that result in symptoms, but if you dive into each of those assumptions, which many of us don't do and I hadn't done, 
and look into the scientific literature, there's not there's often a weak basis for believing the things that I thought were true and the things that much of mainstream medicine believes to be true. Wow, that's a major statement. I mean, I, I, I was just telling Mark that the fact that apparently we don't even know for sure that such a thing as a virus ruined my husband's breakfast this morning. My husband is a retired physician. When I said, hey, guess what? Did you know, we don't even know for sure if there's such a thing as viruses. He almost destroyed my marriage of more than 50 years. This was not a pleasant thing for him to do to my husband's breakfast. Well, let me take a few steps back in case your audience is stunned by the statement you just made, because I was too. And let's let's go back in history. The word virus, according to the Greeks, meant a slimy poison. It wasn't until the 1950s with Watson and Crick's double helix structure of DNA paper, 1953, that genetics became a big part of the medical milieu. And there were some other developments, also the bacteriophage, which relates to uh, particles that are known to exist with bacteria, where the current model of a virus emerged. So it's only really decades old. And the current model of a virus, which when people talk about things like COVID and otherwise, they're talking about an intracellular parasite, something that gets inside of your cell, replicates, and then causes disease in the host. Okay. So that's a very specific definition. And what I didn't realize is that the the belief in that that particle or that organism whatever you want to call it is based on indirect evidence and inference so it's it's impossible to prove that something doesn't exist i want to establish that but there is no direct evidence for it now let me explain let me take one step back first of all which is that people can get sick in the same place with similar symptoms for reasons other than a virus or something contagious for example let's say everyone goes to a party and gets sick you could say oh, well they caught a bug well, maybe there was a toxin in the environment, or maybe they ate similar food that was poisoned. Maybe there was electromagnetic issues. Maybe there were issues of consciousness, which is separate. The point is that we tend to jump to one conclusion that, well, it must have been a contagious particle. It jumped from this person to this person, jumped between their cells. We've never seen any of that, but we assume it. So we're, what we might call to viral diseases, and that's what I talk about in the book, there are other explanations for it potentially to be explored, but they're often not explored because of the mainstream paradigm. So let me go back to the, this question of, of a virus because your audience might be wondering, well, we've seen pictures on TV. They've shown us that the virus actually exists. Well, what are you actually seeing in those pictures? I didn't know until I looked into it. It's, it's a static image under an electron microscope. Static meaning it's not moving. A virus is supposed to be a living thing that's getting inside the cell, replicating, doing all the stuff. And they're so small, allegedly, that you can only see them under an electron microscope, which was only invented in the 1930s and became more prevalent thereafter. So before that, for example, Louis Pasteur, when he was working with rabies, he said, well, I can't see can't see anything there. There must be a virus. The thing with the rabies, I couldn't <laughs> believe. It's like, it's like I, I, tell the story of rabies, because I couldn't believe that. I really couldn't. Well... So Louis Pasteur, and then I want to continue on the um, going back to the electron microscope, but this is, was an interesting one because rabies is often believed to be a contagious virus. Um, and okay, well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to start here because one of the problems with- I, I don't want to put you off track. You don't have to, don't tell the story of rabies, but the point is rabies is like a an illusion, a myth. <laughs> it's not real. Everyone, rabies isn't even real. So- <laughs> Now well, the, so I, I want to I want to make an important clarification there. What we're saying is not real is maybe the cause that's believed to result in symptoms. So we're not disputing that people get sick or animals get sick with symptoms. The question is, is it this particle that's causing it? Yes. Okay. And the, the the real issue is around what's known as virus isolation, and I can tie this into the rabies story as well. In in any scientific study you want to have an independent variable that you introduce in the study and you see what the effect is. But in order to do that, you need to have a thing that you're adding into it. Um, there's an analogy that's often used by a doctor named uh, Dr. Thomas Cowan. He says, if you have a toolbox 
You can take the screwdriver out. You can take the hammer out. You can take each thing out. And that's called isolating that thing from everything else. And once you take it out, you can then study its properties right. and characterize it. The problem with viruses, scientists will say, well, it's too small to do that. So we end up filtering. If someone's sick, we'll take the fluids from that sick person. We'll filter it as much as we can. And then there's another process they might do to infer that the virus is there, but they never actually get just a purified sample of only the virus. Now, right. why is that important? Because if you want to study whether it's making someone sick or, or causing cellular breakdown or something else, you need to have just that variable. Right. And that's not what's done. So this is what goes back to the rabies story and others. There's a woman named Christine Massey who has, uh, she has a background in biostatistics, but she's been working with many other people around the world to submit freedom of information requests to government organizations, CDC, all the biggest organizations all over the world. With regard to SARS-CoV-2, they submitted uh, over 200, they've, they've been in contact with over 200 institutions in 40 countries, and they're asking for a basic thing. Can you show us scientific papers in which the virus is separated from all the other cellular material, where the virus is isolated using the traditional definition of the term isolation. Virologists use a different definition, meaning an independent variable. And what they all come back saying is, we don't have anything responsive to your request. Or they send something saying that, well, we don't do it that way. And this is the same for rabies. There was a, a response in 2021, which I quoted in the book, they've never isolated this virus. So this is problematic then, because if we're going back to the electron microscope, what are they looking at under the microscope? They're looking at an unpurified sample of, th they assume the virus is in it, but there's a lot of other stuff. And they'll say, well, look, the way this thing looks is viral morphology, meaning that 20 years ago or 50 years ago, we saw something similar. But back then, did you know it was a virus if you didn't have a purified sample? These are the, it goes back to these early studies that were not done yeah. properly and people are assuming that they were done. Yes, yes. And the great flu that killed all those people in 1918, 1919, all those young, healthy people who died. And we know it was the great flu killed, caused by a virus. And then they isolated people on an island in Massachusetts. And they tried to give those people uh, I, this is this is in your book. They tried to give these people the disease to prove it was caused by this. And they, they stuck it in their noses and they did all these things to make sure that, they, yes, it was contagious. And they could never make them sick with this disease. Yeah. So they could never prove the disease was contagious. And yet all these people died. Explain yes. that to me because I read it <laughs> twice. I couldn't believe it. When so let me take of it. I want to take a step back. We talk about number one, the existence of this particle known as a virus, that there's a lack of direct evidence for it. But the second part is of a virus is that it causes disease and it can be transmitted from person to person. So what I do in the book is look at various illnesses that are believed to be viral, at least that's the hypothesis, and we just assume it is, and we haven't looked at other possibilities. The Spanish flu is a really interesting one because it killed as many as 50 million people. Yes. And in collaboration with the U.S. Navy and uh, the public health services, this was Dr. Milton Rosenau. Uh, he was a medical doctor. His results were published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And he tried to transmit this illness of people who were sick with the symptoms. He even had people cough in each other's faces. And he was unable to make other people sick. So the question then becomes, How Roberta, they then died of this disease by the millions. Right. So the question, it goes back to my analogy of people being at a party and a bunch of people get sick. We assume it's a, a virus or something else that they caught. Well, what else was happening in the world? And that's what I try to do in this book. I looked at other doctors and researchers who have said, well, we haven't explored these other theories because all the funding's going toward this one hypothesis. And with regard to Spanish flu, there, uh, there is the hypothesis that those who had Certain vaccinations were more likely to get sick. Another really interesting one, there's a book called The Invisible Rainbow published in 2020. The world was industrializing very heavily around that time, and there was an increased um, electricity all over the world, which could potentially, there could be potentially electrical pollution that we're not aware of. Um, and he, uh, Furstenberg in his book talks about how monkeys and baboons were dying in great numbers in South Africa and sheep in Northwest England. Uh, moose in Canada, 
and they weren't we weren't catching the flu from animals but if what we call this influenza was actually caused by something electromagnetic maybe it was affecting all organisms now, i don't know that for sure but these are the hypotheses that might explain what happened my goodness i i just found so many things in your book so shocking that I just couldn't get over it. But the fact that clearly that Spanish flu, which killed all those people, and, and the only people who, I apparently it was the vaccinations that I think that were killing them because the only people who died of it were the people who were vaccinated. There's a book um, by Eleanor McBean, who's a PhD, and she wrote about her personal experience. She wrote this book in 1977. Um, and, and she said, as, as far as I could find out, the flu only hit the vaccinated that those who refused the shots escaped the flu. She said, my family had refused all the vaccinations, so we yes, remained well all the time. Think that. Yes. So there are these anecdotal pieces, but who was actually, everyone was focused on the contagious virus hypothesis. And these other ideas would be called fringe, for example. And I, I think we have to be exploring all the possibilities. If we want to get back to my initial point, why do we get sick? What are the ter determinants of health and disease? We have to look much broader than contagious viruses. The, the people... The people that these young, healthy men who are going into the service who are getting vaccinated because we wanted them to be healthy and they were then getting sick and dying of the vaccinations, I really think. And let's let's think about this even further. This was back in 1918, 1919. This was before the electron microscope. So yeah. even if you know, they, they wouldn't have even been able to see a virus at this point, they were just assuming that something contagious was going around. And it's like a mental exercise where we can't actually see it happening and we create a story. We invent a whole story and animation of what's going on. Just One other point I want to raise, because your audience might be wondering, you might be saying, well, there's so many viruses where we can test for it, where there's a viral antigen or an antibody or a PCR genetic test we're running back into the same problem because if they're talking about anything viral, they're referring to a sample that's not purified, it's not isolated. So they're talking about an indirect metric that's associated with an illness. So it's possible that the body's producing, in the body you can find antigens and antibodies that are associated with certain symptoms because yeah. the body has a stress response to something that isn't a virus. Where there is genetic material that's found, but it's not tied to a virus and you wouldn't know if the genetic material is just tied to a virus, because every time they take the genetic sample, it's not from a purified sample. There could be other stuff in there. And this yeah. is the fundamental problem that people I think want to ignore because they say, oh, well, it's we're close enough to isolating. Well, what if there's other material there that's disrupting all of our results? That's a very big problem. Yes, yes. Yeah, extraordinary. But but go ahead, talk about more. Talk about the, the which I think is a classic case of the government and organized medicine screwing everything up, which was COVID and, mm -hmm. and how it handled, how the government handled all of that. I mean, the, vac the vaccines I ended up with would not prevent the spread and it would not prevent you from catching the disease. So. <laughs> it's a big problem. And I mentioned the freedom of information requests. These were government organizations, over 200 of them in 40 countries. People were asking, show us an isolated virus where the virus is separated from everything else. And they, they're unable to do it. And yet the world was shut down on the basis of this thing that hasn't been fully isolated. That's a problem. And so one of the reasons people are very enthusiastic about this topic, and I should add that I came in late to the game. I usually do that with all my books. Other people were way ahead and then I synthesize. Um, but what the people in the, what you might call the health freedom community, what they would argue, and I also wanna add, there's a split in the health freedom community. There are those who say, look, COVID was used to weaponize um, uh, freedom and it was it was to take away our freedom. And they would say the vaccinations were part of an agenda, but they would say, and there's still a virus. And you shouldn't say that there's no virus because that distracts from the point. Then there are others who say, well, look, there's a lack of scientific evidence that we don't have an independent variable. These studies often don't have proper controls either. And that's important for the scientific method. We haven't established this. We should be looking at the true cause. And these people would say, we need to know the cause of illness because if we don't, there could be another alleged viral pandemic that actually hasn't been established in terms of the cause. And if we don't know the cause of why people are getting sick, then how can we have an appropriate remedy? 
And maybe, yes, there are certain antiviral drugs out there, but in the same way that radiation therapy, for example, it might technically help someone with cancer, it's not because it's specific to the cancer. It's just it has an overall effect. Like chemotherapy is an anti-metabolite in a sense. Antivirals might have a similar effect where they're anti-metabolites, but they're not actually stopping a virus and therefore they're not specific medications. Yeah. And the same would go for vaccination. My point is we need to get clear on the cause of illness to then be able to treat it properly. And, and Roberta, if we don't understand that, then governments can weaponize their control and, and lock people down unnecessarily and so forth. So it's a matter of freedom too. Sorry. And the lockdown was so clumsy. I mean, they, they deliberately in some States like New York put sick people in with old people. And it, this turned out to be a disease primarily of the old and the overweight they were the only people who really died of it. And as a result, they killed so many old people, and um, to which was tragic. And young people, when they got it, they uh, got over it easily. Um, and, they, and they kept children out of school for two years. As a result, children now are two years behind in school, totally necessarily because kids if they get it they get over it and, and children tend not even to get the disease it turns out so so they caused this complete social mess with all the lockdowns yeah, yeah absolutely and a big part of it i would theorize is the fear and isolation what that could do to someone's body when people are, are terrorized yeah. and we're going to get into this with regard to consciousness if their consciousness is in a direction of fear that they're going to die from something they can't see that is problematic. And then you add in social isolation, people aren't communicating, they don't have community in the same way. That can't be a good thing for health. There, there also was the problem of the, uh, in retrospect, it turns out that the, the um, vaccinations were dangerous to young men for some reason that we now still don't understand. I don't know how many young men have died of the, of the shots which turned out not to be not to be useful anyway because they didn't keep you from getting the disease and they didn't keep you from transmitting the disease. So what was what good were the shots? Yeah, well, for one, it's big business. Um, <clears throat> if the whole world is is dealing with a, a fear of an illness to have a cure for it or an alleged cure, that's big business. Also, I want to add that in December of 2020, there was a, a compendium published. Uh, it's called the, the Pfizer Document Analysis Report by War Room and the Daily Clout. What they did was they looked at the FDA. Um, the FDA had asked a federal court to allow 75 years before they publicly released Pfizer's uh, COVID-19 vaccine data. And the court said that the FDA had to start releasing 55,000 pages of this data per month in the public domain. So what this organization did, War Room Daily Clout, they had a team of over 3,000 experts to look at what these documents said. And the short story is that the vaccines were, were not as safe and effective as we were being told, and yet this information is not broadly acknowledged, unfortunately. Totally, totally useless. I, I never tried to keep myself from being exposed to it, yet I never got COVID. I think some people just got it and some people didn't, and it was random. Right. And then my and question is the flu anyway. So who cares? Exactly. So what what is the flu? What is rabies? To me, I look at things now, these are labels that describe symptoms. But this label now doesn't even tell us the cause. Because most people, if you say COVID, they're thinking of this virus SARS-CoV-2, but now we don't know, is it exactly that or something else? So we use these terms now really just as a placeholder for a set of symptoms that seem to be pretty similar among people. Yes. Yeah. It, it's Well, we, we probably should talk a little bit about what we really wanted to talk <laughs> about today. I get so distracted by reading the rest of your book, though. But let's talk about consciousness and its role in in medicine, in disease, because it is such a profound aspect of all of this. Yes, I think it's essential to it. It's the second half of my book. It's arguably more important than everything else. The first half of the book is more traditional medicine and trying to just yes. point out some of the holes, which is important too. But consciousness seems to be fundamental to it. And my one caveat with regard to viruses, uh, there's still a lot to be learned and maybe new information will come out. The point is right now- there's yeah. a problem in terms of we have not scientifically established these entities using the scientific method. I think everyone can agree on that yeah. because of the lack of isolation. 
Um, so now consciousness, to, which I'm sure your audience is very familiar with too. This is my entree into exploring the nature of reality. But if we consider consciousness to be fundamental, if that's true, and if yeah. our health is, if our body is a physical entity, which is really a product of consciousness, then consciousness has to impact our health. And Absolutely. Um, some of the extreme cases would be examples like Anita Morjani, who famously had a near-death experience when she had terminal cancer. She Very was dying. Very terminal cancer, yes. He was gone. Dying that day, yes. Dying that day, had a near-death experience, was um, immersed in unconditional love, encountered her deceased father, resolved things with him, and had this realization about herself that she was too hard on herself, for example. She was resuscitated, came back to life, and her tumors disappeared. And okay. she's she's now healthy, has written about this, speaks all over the world. And these are spontaneous healings. These are anomalies. And the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where I've served on the board since 2019, has, has compiled uh, uh, case studies of these spontaneous remissions that have happened all over the place that are not well explained. And the way I think about anomalies, I first heard this um, from... Well, actually, I'm thinking of uh, Dr. Dean Radin uh, referenced in 1900, there was a guy named Lord Kelvin, who was basically the head of the scientific establishment at the time. And he said, look, we've got most of science figured out, except these two clouds, these two little clouds, these two anomalies that didn't make sense. And what did they turn into? They turned into what we now call relativity theory and quantum mechanics. Yes. The little tiny things, right? Tiny things, the anomalies. <laughs> and I mentioned that because your audience might be saying, well, yeah, that was Anita Morjani. And yeah, there's these spontaneous remissions that come out. My point is that unless we have a theory of reality and of health that can accommodate these things, then we don't really know what's happening. So right. we need to broaden the aperture to say, well, Absolutely. her consciousness shifted and her tumors disappeared. What? And we're giving yeah. people chemotherapy and radiation. So we're right. missing something. Right. Huge. Very huge. <laughs> I'll tell you also, Roberta, it's it's empowering because she shifted her consciousness and she was able to save her life, probably unknowingly at the time. And she probably had an energetic experience too. We don't know exactly how these NDEs work, but there is something powerful to it. And I get into this in the in the chapter seven of the book, which to me is the most important one. It's all the consciousness stuff where someone like your audience was going to be most receptive to it. But uh, I quote Dr. David Hawkins, one of my favorite spiritual teachers. He wrote a book called Healing and Recovery, and he talked about his own life, how he was able to heal himself of all kinds of ailments. He couldn't even keep track of all the diseases he had, but it was because of the, the shifts in his belief systems and getting rid of unconscious guilt and emotions. And there's a new and emerging field that I'm increasingly interested in called German New Medicine. It was conceived in the 1970s, and it's very much related to consciousness, where the idea is that our symptoms what we call disease, are related to an emotional conflict shock. And when we have an emotional shock, our body builds up defenses. And then when we resolve the shock, the body has symptoms of resolution as it clears out the excess cells that were built up in the body as a result of the emotional conflict. So the symptoms are often in this methodology or this ideology, the symptoms are the sign that you're resolving something. And if you have chronic symptoms, it might mean that you have a chronic stimulus of an emotional shock. So it's something just totally different to look at than what mainstream medicine would say, which is here, yes. take this one pill to cure it. Yep. Yep. I've had recently, I have had some guests on Seek Reality who have had chronic diseases and they, that and medicine gave up on them and they had to cure themselves and that's what they did and it basically was consciousness that they used to do it so again that is a principle which is which medicine should look into because it works really well really well well i'll tell you a problem with it it's not profitable in the same way that pills are and it can actually it cure you a whole lot better than pills do <laughs> yes yeah. It can get to the root cause of why the symptoms are there rather than trying to mask the symptoms. Now, I don't want to say that all of allopathic medicine is terrible. There's certainly value in the pills sometimes as an emergency. But what we're talking about here is root cause. How, why are people sick and healthy? And it seems right. like consciousness. Right. If you really get into your own mindset and look at beliefs and look at the thoughts and look at trauma, clearing those sorts of things or transmuting them can result in massive health improvements. I'll tell you someone else who really understood the power of mind over matter. Jesus said, mm. if you have 
as much faith as this little much, a grain of mustard seed, that little bit of faith, you can tell a mountain, go from here to there and it'll obey you. That's true. But people don't still don't get what he was talking about. This is what he was talking about. Right. Because we believe so firmly in a physical world that is just That's static right. and it's not influenced by our consciousness. And furthermore, there's a belief that our consciousness is not part of something that we might call divine. Those are simple statements, but if you firmly internalize that, which I'm still in the process of trying to do myself, but yes. if you do, it seems it's like- hard. That, we tend yeah. to believe solid stuff is solid, but it's not. Actually, it's not. It's 99.9999999, seven nines after that point, <laughs> percent empty. That's a fact. That's a scientific fact. Yeah. So if this if that's all it is, of course your mind is more powerful than that. And that's yeah. what we have to get used to understanding this true about reality. So that's a, what we're working with. Yeah. And, and it goes back to so much of what you cover on the show, Roberta, the nature of reality is being misunderstood everywhere, especially mm -hmm. in academia. And that includes the medical establishment. So the, the way right. of thinking is a physicalist materialist perspective on the body, which is that we are just a sack of meat and it's all physical. And that assumption is going to embed all of the ways of trying to treat illness. That's right. That's right. No, but, but what you are doing in trying to give people this basic information, and I, I recommend everybody read your book because I think it really rocks everybody's world. It's powerful. It's exciting, even though my marriage is a little shaky today, but I think I can fix it. But but uh, but no, I mean, doctors are so in, have ingrained in them the notion that this allopathic medicine is somehow sacred. And it's not. It's it's just a belief system. It's 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 a shakier belief system even than religion is. And if it were working so well. We would probably have much less chronic illness. There would be so many illnesses that we would be treating better. There are so many viral conditions that we would be doing better with. And that's not to say we haven't made advancements, but we're clearly not a healthy society. So the idea to me that we're far off, thats that seems very reasonable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so what, 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 what have you learned from all of this? Because this is, you, you've done all these books and basically, everywhere you've looked, you've seen major screw ups. Mm. What have you learned? I mean, do you do you see anything solid in our society you can stand on? Now, my perception on this has shifted. When I first learned about the primacy of consciousness, the idea that consciousness does not come from the brain, that our consciousness continues when the body dies, psychic phenomena are real, that was totally mind blowing to me. And I thought, well, there have been shifts throughout history where people just believe something and they innocently, innocently got it wrong. And that's just part of human psychology. I do think that's part of it. But the fact that, as you point out, there's systemic misunderstanding, systemic ignorance in clear ways where the truth is out there. If you actually just look, these freedom of information requests and responses from the CDC and others, anyone can read them, but they're not being talked about on the news. So there is also a systemic, not just ignorance, but deception. And that's where deception, I am. Exactly. Right. We, we live in a world of deception. That's what I, I'm where I'm coming out on this, where it is an intentional desire for the truth to be concealed. And where, where I stand now is that it's part of our evolutionary journey to see through the wolf in sheep's clothing and and discover the truth and then embody it. But it's not always going to appear as it seems. I, I used to have a more uh, naive perspective that it would be very easy to spot evil. And sure, there are murderers out there. But, but there's also the wolf in sheep's clothing, that which presents as benevolent and helpful, but actually is not. So what happens next? Let's say there's another, but much more maybe dangerous virus on the horizon. And the government says, oh, oh, this one is really a lot more dangerous. What mm -hmm. do you think will happen then? Well, the first thing I will do is I will try to be very precise with my language. I will say what's actually happening. I'm not going to overlay any words that that are inferences. There are a lot of people who are getting sick with similar symptoms, and a lot of them are dying. I don't know why that happened. Maybe they test positive on a test. That's an indirect metric. But I would love to see the isolation of the particle that's alleged to do these things. 
And until that, I'm going to be asking questions of, well, is there another reason that people are getting sick? What's going on in the environment? What's going on psychologically? What's going on with consciousness? What's going on with toxicity in the air, in the food, and all those other questions? And until those things are answered, I'm going to be skeptical of any alleged cure, whether it's a lockdown or a medication, because the the cause hasn't been established. Now, if I'm doing that and I'm late to the game, I know there are many others too. So there is a question here of how rapid the collective wake up will be, whether how many people are going to be asking those questions versus just listening to the headlines. I personally believe that just like the wolf, the, the boy who cried wolf, whatever the government says, nobody is going to believe them, unfortunately, because they screwed the COVID thing up so badly. Almost no matter what they say, nobody's going to believe them. And that's yeah. kind of tragic in a way. Because what if it's what if this one is really a serious situation? They definitely lost trust. Even in the people who are the most ardent followers, I feel like people are loosening their trust. Yeah. I mean, I cannot imagine ever again letting them put a needle in my arm. I'm old, so it doesn't matter as much for me, but I can't imagine wanting them to put a needle in one of my children or grandchildren's arms either. Yeah, I certainly would want to know what the ingredients are, what the studies have been. I would want transparency the about the fact that, that there's no long-term testing and that therefore we can't make any claims about long-term health. And that was not done this time. So there's just a lot of questions that need to be asked and it should be okay to ask them. The young men dying of heart issues and they're really not giving us much information about that, but that never happened before they started with all these shots. Well, one of the problems, and I mentioned, I reference a book in my book, it's called Vax Unvax by RFK Jr. and his co-author named uh, Brian Hooker, where they compiled some of the studies that compare vaccinated populations to unvaccinated populations and which ones are healthier not just with regard to the thing that they're supposed to be vaccinated for, but also who has more heart disease, who has more eczema, who has more autism, all these things that you think people would want to be looking for in the long term. And they found more health problems in these studies with the vaccinated groups. So these sorts of things are not typically done because we say, oh, well, they were just vaccinated for this one thing. We don't need to worry about anything else. And they don't always track what, what was actually going on for that person and whether they got sick from something else because they took the shot. We just don't have as much data. Yeah. No, I, I unfortunately, I think the government has burned a tremendous amount of trust uh, in a very short time. And uh, I, there's no way you get it back. I don't see how they get it back now. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> tragically, really. Yes, I, I see it as both tragic, but also an opportunity for the public to start taking more personal responsibility for that's health true. and other things. And that's, to me, a part of our spiritual evolution is not to necessarily offload to the authority figures, while at the same time having the humility to acknowledge that there are experts who know a lot more than we do. So there's this balance of the discernment of the wolf in sheep's there clothing. Maybe people that come forward that we quickly learn to trust. That may be, that may be the alternative that happens. I think that's a, I, I like the way you're phrasing that. I think that's what's happening is the truth is coming out. And then there are people who we're going to look to, to say, these people are professing knowledge, but they're not doing it with pure confidence. They're purely transparent. They have humility. They were right before, and now they have a track record. record. Let's keep listening. Yes. There are some, some people that you do cite in your book that um, I know from having done reading in the past do seem to be both humble and trustworthy. And I think I would trust if they step forward to be leaders. You're reminding but me of a quote government from- Let them do it. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, government will let them. Well, the technology companies let them. Social media, there's a lot of censorship of that. Even I've been looking at artificial intelligence more with uh, the host of Skeptico. His name's Alex Sekiris, who has a background in AI. But if you ask it questions- so it, it, generative AI is basically like Google search on steroids. And you can ask it questions and it immediately responds. The problem is what, is, it, what is the information it's using to give you a response? So if you ask, has a virus been isolated? They're going to give you a certain response. But then if you pick at it and ask questions, you start to get to the truth. My point here is that 
the information we get is pre-screened or it's biased in a certain direction, which means that we all as individuals have to be active in the process of trying to discern yeah. the truth. Be interesting. Yeah, we, there, there is a Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times, and that Chinese curse is starting to be fulfilled right mm. now. Oh, my dear, we could talk forever, but we have come actually past the end of our time. I think uh, we're going to have to have you back again. When are you writing another book? Uh, like I always say, I don't have one planned. I don't know if I'll write another one. It would have to be something that is this big for me to be interested. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we just have to do as much as we can to get as much publicity as we can for what you have written, because it's certainly a major, major opus at this point you've got so much out there that we just have to get get more publicity for at this point anyway everyone this has been roberta grimes for um with seek reality and with my wonderful wonderful friend mark gober and um we, we'll be we'll be doing this again next week um again meanwhile Till we speak again, please remember you are a powerful, powerful eternal, eternal being. We, you never begin, you never will end, and uh, please never, ever forget that. Next week, our guest will be Mark Ireland, who will be here for the third time. Mark is a longtime student of the evidence. I think he followed you last time, too. Hmm. Um, and the two of you really fascinate me. Mark is a longtime student of the evidence for death and the afterlife, but I hadn't talked with him for the better part of a decade before he was our guest again earlier this year. So when I came across his name, I thought, now what happened to him? And I got to wondering, and he's been up to a lot. So sure enough, when he turned up again and I wanted to talk to him and I just, because I find him fascinating. So we're going to enjoy visiting with him again together next week. This week, our guest has been Mark Gober, who I just love. As you can see, he... Whatever he sees and gets interested in, he just digs into and he finds out that everybody is on the wrong track. And he is just, just fascinating. An end to upside down thinking, an end to upside down medicine. This book, I think, is the best of all of his books because he really has found my husband is a retired physician. Nothing upsets him anymore, but I really ruined his day to day when I told him about this book. Medicine scoots along the top of everything. It is really not digging into what is true because it doesn't understand the influence of consciousness on everything that makes us sick. I believe everybody ought to read and end to upside down medicine. Please get this book, please read it, and then please take responsibility for your own health because believe me, Medicine is not taking, the, well, the medical community is not taking responsibility that it needs to for your own health. I loved this book. I'm going to read it over again now. All of Mark's books are very well written. They're easy to read, and they're full of shocking truths that everybody ought to know. And now, of course, it's time once again to mention that Seek Reality Online is your one-stop resource for all things afterlife. It's time once again, too, to take responsibility for that because, like it or not, you're going to live forever. So it's time to know what the next stage is going to be like. Craig Hogan is the president of Seek Reality Online, and he's gathered all that information for you. So spend, spend a little time there and learn what your eternity is going to be like, it's much, much better than you can possibly imagine. And teachingsbyjesus.com is your single resource for all the beautiful divine truths that Master Jesus actually taught. Christianity is not his religion. It's the Roman Emperor Constantine's religion. And as it dies, Jesus finally is going to have his turn. And it's going to be a beautiful turn. So join him there. And as you know, I have my own nonfiction books, but there's some time left to talk about them because we've been having too much amazing fun with Mark. So please go to my website and learn about my books too. And all of the more than 500 past episodes of Seek Reality are available wherever audio podcasts can be found, or you can listen to new audio episodes each week with the Seek Reality app that you can find wherever free apps are available. And you can see the new video episodes each week on Roku or Fire Stick, YouTube and elsewhere. And meanwhile, this has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Please enjoy and make the most of this coming week in our one reality. 
always knowing that you are a powerful, eternal being, and you, most of all, in this whole universe, you are infinitely, eternally, and perfectly loved.